Welcome guys to this Age of Empires 2 video, an amazing announcement of the Dynasties of India DLC for Age of Empires 2. It's going to be fantastic, three new civilizations, the Bengalis, the Dravidians and the Gurjaras. There's going to be three new civilizations and let's take a look at the quick trailer that they've released and then we'll get more into the details. My life has been an adventure and it all began in Transoxiana. The melting pot of Persian high culture and nomadic traditions. I tell of warriors and weapons, faith and fury. The greatest ruler of the Pala dynasty, Devapala. As a newly crowned ruler, my father took the name Raja Raja. When I return to Tanjavo, Raja Raja will know what his son is capable of. Wow, it looks like it's going to be fantastic. The campaigns look really interesting. Now let's take a look at the three individual civilizations. Let's start off with the Bengalis. So with the information we've been given so far, we can expect to navigate the winding rivers and dense jungles of Bengal as you build a thriving economy to fuel unstoppable armies of elephants. The Bengali unique unit is the Rata, a sturdy chariot that can switch between melee and ranged attack modes. Well, wait, what? It can switch between melee and ranged attack? That looks completely new and very interesting. Okay, so the Bengalis focus on elephant and naval units. Bengali elephants, in addition to benefiting from a strong technology tree, are more resistant to anti-elephant bonus damage than those of other civilizations. Additionally, their attack speed can be boosted by researching the unique technology, Pikes, which also improves Ratas. Bengali ships regenerate hit points, increasing their longevity. These strengths are built on the back of a strong economy. That's pretty cool. So the Bengali ships can actually regenerate health uh, over time. Interesting. Going to be pretty good on the uh, waters then, I guess. Bengali town centers automatically spawn additional villages whenever each age is reached, and the Bengalis can support a larger economy after researching the unique technology, Mahayana, which reduces the amount of population space that each villager takes up. Wait, whoa, that's incredible. Finally, Bengali trade units and those of their allies generate food in addition to the gold that is accumulated during each trip to and from the allied market. Okay, that's a pretty cool introduction, I have to say. Let's take a look at the actual civilization bonuses and the tech tree and the unique units and whatnot. So, the civilization bonuses. Elephant units receive 25% less bonus damage and are more resistant to conversion. Town centers spawn two villages when the next age is reached. Ships regenerate 15 HP per minute. That's a really interesting mechanic, the fact you get your new villages, uh, more villages when the next age is reached. Certainly something that we've never seen before. Unique units, buildings, and technologies. Unique units, the Rata, Bengali unique chariot that can switch between melee and ranged attacks. Strong versus infantry, weak versus skirmishers and camel riders. The armored elephant, anti-building cavalry unit, resistant to most ranged attacks, weak versus melee units, and it cannot be converted by enemy monks from distance. Well, cannot be converted? All right, so yeah, I've had a look at the tech tree. We'll go into that in detail anyway, but the armored elephant is, is essentially a siege unit, which is pretty cool. And it looks like it's produced from the siege workshop itself. So that's uh, pretty interesting. All right, so the unique techs, the pakes, ratas and elephant units attack 20% faster. Mahayana, villagers take 10% less population space. Team bonus, trade units yield 10% food in addition to gold. So pretty cool for uh, team games, that's for sure. Okay, so let's take a look at the tech tree guys. Looking at the archery range, they get up to the Arbalester, but they only get up to elite skirmisher, no hand cannoneers, and they don't get any cav archers. So for you cav archer lovers out there, I'm afraid this sieve is probably not for you. But what they do get guys is the elephant archer. We've seen this with the Indian civilization from the castle, but this is gonna be from the archery range. Really interesting. Um, we don't have any stats on this just yet. It'd be really interesting to see the stats, you know, for these units, but hopefully that'll be coming out soon. They don't get Thumb Ring, uh, but they do get Parthian Tactics. All right, let's take a look at the Barracks. So they get Militia, they get Man-at-Arms Lines, all the way up to Champions. They get the Halberdier, uh, but they don't, obviously they don't get, they're not Mesosiv, so they won't get the Eagles. 
they get squires they get arson so a pretty pretty nice barracks i mean we have to bear in mind guys we need to talk about the blacksmith really when we look into this we'll go into that next but the uh, stable this is where it gets really interesting for the civilization they get bloodlines they already get up to light cav uh, but they don't get knights or camels they just get elephants this is just like a pure elephant sieve in terms of cavalry they get the battle elephant and the elite battle elephant and they do get husbandry which is obviously very useful uh, elephants will probably end up being quite slow as well so uh, husbandry is certainly going to be uh, needed there okay so let's scroll over to the siege workshop side of things they don't get battering ram they don't get any rams in fact but they get the armored elephant and the siege elephant that's pretty incredible because i mean elephants generally are pretty good against buildings but these must be incredible uh these must be really strong all right so they get mangonels they get onagers but they don't get siege onager they get scorpions they get heavy scorpions they get siege towers but they don't get the bombard cannons they don't get the bbc's moving on to the blacksmith side of things this is where it gets really important i mean they get basically everything apart from the third melee armor upgrade the plate mail armor now the dock side of things they do actually get everything apart from heavy demo ships now this civilization is known as an infantry and naval civilization and so you'd expect them to have the fully kitted out dock it's a bit of a shame about the heavy demolition ships but well i guess they couldn't necessarily have it all could they moving swiftly on to the university and the castle side of things the university is fully kitted out apart from bombard tower and the castle side of things they got the rata the unique unit and they've got the Pikes. I think it's Pikes or Pikes. I'm not too sure how to pronounce it. Guys, in the comment section below, let me know how to pronounce it if you know. And then the Mahayana. We've discussed those a little bit earlier, but just to recap, the Pikes gives the Ratas and the Elephant units an attack speed of 20% faster. And the Mahayana, villagers take 10% less population space. And for all the arena clowns out there, they get a full monastery apart from heresy. I hope you guys liked that run through of the Bengalis. Now let's take a look at the Dravidians. Seize control of the lucrative Indian Ocean trade routes and utilize advanced metallurgy. As you build one of the wealthiest sea empires of medieval Asia, the Dravidian unique units are the Urumi Swordsman, a warrior wielding a scathing flexible sword, and the Thrisi Sadai, a massive vessel that dominates the high seas. The Dravidians focus on infantry and naval units, cheaper barracks technologies, a strong technology tree, the devastating Yurumi Swordsman unique unit, and the unique technology Wootz Steel, which causes infantry and cavalry attacks to ignore the armor of enemy units, make Dravidian infantry among the most formidable in the game. In addition to being able to access the powerful Thrissi Sadai, Dravidian naval power is augmented by increased carry capacity for fishing ships and fishermen as well as the fact that their docks and those of their allies provide additional population room. However, another Dravidian trademark is pure versatility. Upon advancing to each age, the Dravidians receive 200 additional wood that can be put towards a variety of uses and strategies. Their skirmishers and elephant archers fire faster, making them more effective in combat. Additionally, their elephant units will regenerate hit points once the unique technology Medieval Corpse is researched increasing their longevity. So in summary, the civilization bonuses are that they receive 200 wood when advancing to the next age, the fishermen and fishing ships have an extra carrying capacity of 15, the barracks technologies cost 50% less, and the skirmishers and elephant archers attack 25% faster. Looking at the unique units, buildings and technologies, the Yurumi Swordsman is a Dravidian unique infantry unit which can charge its attack, which is strong against buildings and infantry but weak against archers and long range. They have the Armoured Elephant, which is an anti-building cavalry unit resistant to most ranged attacks, but it's weak against melee units, but it can't be converted by enemy monks from distance. The Theory Sadai, Dravidian unique warship that fires multiple projectiles, which is strong versus warships. The unique techs are Medical Corps, where the elephant units regenerate 20 HP per minute, Wood Steel, where infantry and cavalry attacks ignore armor, and their team bonus is that docks provide an extra 5 population room. Now let's take a look at the tech tree. Now their archers go all the way up to Arbalester. They get hand cannoneers. They get elite skirmishers. But they don't get any cavalry archers. And they get the elephant archer as well as the elite elephant archer. They get thumb ring but no Parthian tactics. Looking at the barracks they get the full militia line all the way up to champion. They get full halberdiers. They get supplies, squires and arson. Looking at the stable, they get the scout cavalry, the light cavalry, but they don't get the hussar and they only get the battle elephant without the elite upgrade. 
moving on to the siege workshop they don't get any rams but of course they get the armored elephant and the siege elephant they get the mangonel line all the way up to siege onager they get heavy scorpion they get the siege tower but they don't get bombard cannons looking at the blacksmith it's fully kitted out except the last and final cavalry upgrade in terms of the armor which is the plate barding armor in terms of the dock they get absolutely everything Next up, we're taking a look at the university where they get everything apart from architecture and treadmill crane and they get the full tower line including bombard towers. Looking at the castle, they have the Yurumi Swordsman as their special unique unit which upgrades to elite and in terms of the research, they get medical corps and the Woods steel. We've talked about that earlier, but just as a recap, medical corps allows the elephant units to regenerate 20 HP per minute and then Woods steel allows the infantry and cavalry to attack by ignoring armor. Looking at the monastery, they don't get redemption, they don't get illumination, they don't get heresy or fervor. It's also worth noting that they don't get gold shaft mining, stone shaft mining, and they also don't get crop rotation. Okay guys, so I hope you enjoyed that run through of the Dravidians. Now let's take a look at the next civilization, the Gurjaras. Ride swift mounts across the fertile fields and open plains of Western India and unleash diverse armies of sturdy warriors upon your enemies. The Gurjara unique units are the Shravamsha Rider, a speedy cavalry unit that can dodge enemy attacks, and the Chakram Thrower, an infantry unit that unleashes volleys of deadly metal discs. The Gurjaras also begin the game with a Camel Scout instead of a Scout Cavalry, and can train more Camel Scouts starting in the Feudal Age. The Gurjaras focus on cavalry and camelry. Their mounted units deal additional bonus damage against the enemy units that they counter, while their cavalry and elephants, and those of their teammates, also train faster. Gurjara Camelry also benefit from additional armor once the unique technology Frontier Guards is researched. The Gurjaras also benefit from a variety of useful economic bonuses. They begin the game with two additional forage bushes near their town center and they can garrison livestock inside of mills to slowly but indefinitely generate food instead of slaughtering them with villagers. Gurjara docks can be garrisoned by fishing ships allowing theirs and those of their allies to take refuge when under attack. Finally, researching the unique technology, Kshatriyas reduces the full cost of all military units, making them more affordable and easy to mass. In summary, the civilization bonuses are that they start with two forage bushes, they can garrison mills with livestock to produce food, mounted units deal 50% plus bonus damage, and they can garrison docks with fishing ships. Looking at the unique units, buildings and technologies, the unique units, the Chakram Thrower. This is a Gurjara unique infantry unit with ranged melee attack. It's strong versus infantry, but weak versus archers and siege weapons. The Shrivamsha Rider is a Gurjara unique light cavalry unit which can dodge projectiles. Strong versus archers, weak versus pikemen and camel riders. The Camel Scout. This is a Gurjara unique scout unit which is strong versus cavalry, weak versus pikemen, monks and archers. They have the Armored Elephant which is an anti-building cavalry unit resistant to most ranged attacks, it's weak versus melee units, and it can't be converted by enemy monks from distance. The unique techs include Kshatriyas, where military units cost minus 25% food, and Frontier Guards, where camel riders and elephant archers have plus four melee armor. The team bonus are that camel and elephant units are created 25% faster. Let's now take a peek at the tech tree. With the archery range, they're missing Arbalesta, but they do get crossbowmen, they get hand cannoneers and elite skirmishers, they're missing the cavalry archer line, and of course they get the elephant archer with the elite upgrade, they get thumb ring, but no party and tactics. With the barracks, they get the militia line, but they only go up to two-handed swordsmen, so they're missing the champion, and they only get spearmen, so they're missing pikemen, and they're missing halberdier. They have supplies and arson, but they're missing squires. With the stable, they've got the full scout line all the way up to hussar, they've got bloodlines, and they have their Shrivamsha Rider, which is their unique unit, as well as the Camel Rider and Heavy Camel Riders. They're missing the Nightline, and they also do not have access to the Battle Elephant. Looking at the Siege Workshop, they don't have access to any of the Rams, but they do have that Armoured Elephant. They have Mangonels and Onager, but no Siege Onager I'm afraid. They've got Heavy Scorpions, and they also have Bombard Cannons. Looking at the Blacksmith, unfortunately they're missing the third and final Armour Upgrade for Archer Line, which is the ring archer armor. Also, they're missing blast furnace. Looking at the dock, they're missing fast fire ships, as well as dry dock, and they're missing their elite cannon galleon. 
looking at the university, they're missing siege engineering, bombard tower and arrow slits. From the castle, they have their unique unit, the Chakram Thrower, as well as their unique technology upgrades. From their monastery, they're missing faith and block printing. They're missing two mantle, which is the third and final wood upgrade, as well as missing guilds from the market. I hope you guys enjoyed that run through of the Gurjaras. Now let's talk a little bit more about the fully voiced campaigns. And to look at them in turn, first of all, we're talking about Babur. Nearly a century after Tamerlane's death, his descendants are still fighting for supremacy in Transoxiana and Persia. The youngest among them is Zahir ad-Din Muhammad, also known as Babur, the Tiger. He dreams of restoring the crumbled empire, but another wave of invading horsemen from the northern steppes is about to change everything. In this campaign, you'll play as the Tatars and the Hindustanis. Another campaign is about Rajendra. The dread of inevitable corruption plagues the ambitious Rajendra Chola as he navigates the harsh political climate of South India. Can Rajendra escape moral decay as he expands the empire that he inherited from his father? Or is his fear of corruption the true enemy within? In this campaign, you'll play as the Dravindians. And the third campaign is Devapala. Guided by the teachings of Mahayana Buddhism, Devapala rules a rich and vibrant empire. However, as dangerous rivals threaten his realm, the ambitious emperor finds it increasingly difficult to balance his policies with his morals. Will the ends ultimately justify the means? Or will Devapala's quest for his own enlightenment and that of his subjects fail? In this campaign, you play as the Bengalis. Now we also have a reworking of the previously known Indian civilization and they're rebranded and recalled as the Hindustanis. Stake your claim to populace, diverse lands and lucrative trade routes as you parry foreign invasions or step into the invaders shoes yourself. The Hindustani unique units are the Gulam, a heavily armoured infantry unit adept against masses of archers and the Imperial Camel Rider, a powerful unique upgrade to the Heavy Camel Rider. The Hindustanis focus on camelry and gunpowder units. Their camelry attack faster than those of other civilizations and deal additional damage to buildings, while their gunpowder units are more heavily armoured than their counterparts. The Hindustanis can research the unique technology Shatagni, which increases the range of hand cannoneers. The Hindustanis also have an excellent economy, their villages are less expensive than those of other civilizations and their unique technology Grand Trunk Road boosts all sources of gold income. Additionally, they can construct the Caravanserai, a building that heals and increases the speed of trade units within its vicinity. Looking at the civilization bonuses, the villagers cost minus 10% and Dark Age, minus 15% in Feudal Age, minus 20% in Castle Age and minus 25% in Imperial Age. The Camel Riders attack 25% faster Gunpowder units have 1 plus PS armor. They can also build the Caravanserai in Imperial Age. Looking at the unique units, buildings and technologies, the unique units include the Ghulam, which is a Hindustani, a unique infantry unit that thrusts a spear through multiple targets. It's strong versus archers, but weak versus cavalry. They also have the Imperial Camel Rider. The unique buildings include the Caravanserai, which is an economic building and heals and increases the speeds of trade carts in a 10 tile radius. It's the unique building of the Hindustanis. They have the unique technologies of the Grand Trunk Road, where all gold income is 10% faster. Also, Shatagni, where hand cannoneers have plus 2 range. Their team bonus are that camel and light cavalry units have 2 plus attack versus buildings. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this really detailed dive into the DLC which is coming out for Age of Empires 2 and I hope you did like this video. If you did, do give the video a thumbs up and share it with your friends because I think this is going to be a very popular downloadable content for Age of Empires 2. What I'd really like to hear from you guys is what do you think about these civilizations and do you have any preferences? Which civilization do you think is going to be your favorite from this DLC? Let me know in the comment section below. Take care guys and see you next time.